Our speaker today is Dr. Chuck Swindoll. He serves as our chancellor here at DTS. And prior to becoming chancellor, he served as the fourth president of our seminary. He has devoted his life to the accurate, practical teaching and ac application of God's word and his grace, a pastor at heart. Chuck has served as senior pastor to congregations in Texas, Massachusetts, and California. Since 1998, he has served as the founder and senior pastor teacher of Stonebriar Community Church in Frisco, Texas. Dr. Swindoll is the author of more than 90 books, and he is the featured Bible teacher on the popular radio program, Insight for Living, which is aired nearly 2,000 times daily worldwide. He and his wife Cynthia, think about that a minute. He and his wife Cynthia reside here in the Metroplex and love to spend much of their time with their four grown children, 10 grandchildren, and six great grandchildren. Help me in welcoming to our pulpit today, Dr. Charles Swindoll. Thank you. Thank you. Always great to be with you, and it's always a mystery that I have to wrestle through when it comes to choosing what to talk on. Because you've heard everything <laughs> from everybody. And so no matter what subject, uh, you, you, you've heard it from someone, and you've heard it certainly from someone better than I could say it. But here I am to give it a try. What I try to do when I'm here is, I say try to, because time alone will tell if that's true. I try to talk on things that cover two bases. First of all, they are interesting. Uh, if it isn't interesting, it's not your fault, it's mine. So I, I, I like to make it interesting and keep it interesting. And if it isn't, you're free to leave. If you're bored, <laughs> honestly, you're, you, if you're bored, don't go to sleep. Leave and go study, you know. But <laughs> I want to keep it interesting. Second, I want to bring things that I never heard when I was at seminary. The things I share truly are things that were never addressed. It wasn't that someone deliberately wanted to keep the students in the dark. It's just they weren't the kind of things that were talked about back when I was a student. Uh, we got great truth, but... Uh, we rarely got information that we could, we could pack up and take with us and use in the practical side of the ministry. That's what I have in mind. And so my talks are invariably along the practical side. Plus, I'm not that bright, and so I don't try to get into areas that make the faculty frown. And uh, when they start frowning, I'm the guy that wants to leave and study with you. So I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm, I'm gonna talk about things that maybe not even they have addressed, and no doubt should, in light of the times in which we live. And, and they are tough times. They are tough. Uh, they're tougher than when I left seminary, and they were tough then, but they're tougher now. I have a grandson-in-law uh, who uh, just got on the police force in a little Texas town south of here. We had lunch with him along with, we had all together 11 of our family because uh, one of them uh, went through an adoption recently, and we all celebrated. So he came up from, his wife's a student at Texas A&M, and so they came up from College Station to be with us. He's, he's on the police force at Brenham. And I said, you know, it's hard for me to imagine a drug problem in Brenham. And he laughed out loud. He looked at me like I was from another planet. He said, there are drug problems everywhere. In fact, you can't name a problem that isn't in the little town of Brenham which, again, is an awakening for me at this age. I should know that, but I sometimes think some of these little places are sort of sheltered. There is no sheltered place. 
You will not go to a place where you will be free of the uh, tentacles of depravity, uh, which has a big part uh, to do with what I want to want to talk about. The Living Bible uh, renders Job 14.1 like this. How frail is man, how few his days, how full of trouble. The only word I change is man because it's humanity. How frail are people, including those who minister. I left feeling strong after I had finished at the seminary. It wasn't long before I realized just how weak I I am. And though I have gifts and they are strengths in my life, nevertheless, uh, down inside me are weaknesses that I will carry with me to the grave and the same for you. Now, in light of that, I want to look at two perspectives of the ministry that are opposites. This semester, I want to look at the dark side, and I would put it under the category of what makes the ministry so challenging? Why is it that I get an email from a guy just this morning that tells me he's leaving the ministry? What was it that was so challenging that he couldn't continue in it. He's one of our grads. Uh, And the next semester, I want to talk about what makes the ministry so charming or fulfilling to keep a guy like me in it for over half a century. And I wake up every morning so motivated and excited about the opportunity to serve Christ in whatever capacity. And not every day is, is that great, but the privilege of serving Christ is always great. Now, what are the things that cause ministry to become difficult, challenging? Why are times sometimes dark? And I've, uh, I've, I've limited the answer to... Uh, Three areas. One of them I want to talk on today. The next one I want to talk on on the 6th of October when I'm back. And then the third on the 28th of November when I'm here for the third time for this semester. The first is the difficult people who are around us. That's part of the reason ministry is so challenging. You will encounter difficult people throughout your ministry. I was never told that at seminary. (laughs) I don't know why it was a surprise, because I had difficult fellow students uh, to get along with, and I was a difficult one as well. It, It stands to reason, but we often don't think about it. Your time in ministry will be spent with difficult people. And uh, if you allow it, and if you don't know how to handle them, if they get the best of you, then you're among the statistics. And you finally say, just isn't worth it. And you can't go to some country where they're not uh, present. You can't go into any work where it isn't true. You can't be on any faculty where there aren't other difficult faculty members. You can't go to a school where there aren't difficult students. And you can't serve in a pastorate where there aren't difficult <laughs> members of the church. So that's the subject I want to address today, the difficult people around us. The second will be in October, I'll talk about the human tendencies within us. That also makes ministry challenging. I uh, put together a little list. Uh, An argumentative spirit, narcissism, pride, deceit, envy, An unsubmissive spirit, a suspicious spirit, hypocrisy, jealousy, envy, lust, a number of neuroses and psychoses, and evil tendencies. Uh, Those are things that, that go on inside of us, and you take them with you. 
If you are impatient now, you will be impatient in your ministry. If you have an acrid tongue, you will have an acrid tongue in ministry. That won't change unless you, you really go to work on those uh, techniques that will curb those tendencies. Because you're born, you, you, you call it, it goes with the depravity package. And you've got that to deal with. That also makes it. And, and people who have those tendencies will, will make life in ministry difficult for you. Uh, we have a saying, if it weren't for people, ministry would be a breeze. Uh, and uh, that it, it's true, but stop to think, if it weren't for people, we wouldn't have a ministry. Well, we wouldn't have points of accountability. I wouldn't have a team of people to work with at our great church out in Frisco. Uh, I wouldn't have close friends. Uh, I wouldn't have folks to listen when I preach or teach. I, I wouldn't have a reason to prepare or to hone creative skills that God has given me. It's people that are so vital to our ministry, and yet uh, they can really be ornery. And, and some of them, as I'm going to mention, can even be dangerous. So... Uh, there are, the, there are the people, and then there are those tendencies within us. Now, the third uh, has to do with uh, things that happen to us. I call them circumstance, unexpected circumstances. You can get your degree. You can finish well. You can uh, be fairly proficient in the areas of your gift, but... Uh, once you have gotten underway in ministry, things can occur apart from uh, your being ready for them. Your spouse can walk out on you and, and want a divorce from you. Changes the whole face of ministry. That was never addressed in my years at Dallas Seminary. Uh, you can, uh, you can get a report from your doc, and he says you have less than two years uh, to live. <clears throat> and a, a circumstance that happens to you, a tragedy can occur in your city or in your church. And, and it, you didn't see it coming, but it, it makes ministry there difficult. Uh, you can realize as things change around you that you no longer fit. I've got on my phone uh, in, in the car right now uh, a, a note from a, a young man that graduated some 15 years ago from the school. And he's just made a decision to leave that particular place where he's been serving faithfully. And he said, I no longer fit the particular ministry it has become. So that ministry area has changed he doesn't fit it i never once heard the word fit at the school i want you to hear it if from others as well as from me fit is a, is a big part of why we are called to a ministry or why we're able to stay there the fit is is uh, sometimes tailor-made. I, I, I went to New England. I was there for two years. It's the longest decade of my life, I, I, I'll tell you. And it wasn't New England's fault. I didn't fit the scene. Uh, and you've heard that story from me before. Uh, others go, and a young man went that I mentored when I was at the seminary, loved him. He was from that area. He went back to that area. His entire Years of ministry, he recently retired, uh, were spent right there in Connecticut, and he loved it. And I was always kind of amazed that, that he, uh, but he, he understood that, uh, that setting, that scene. In, in my November meeting with you, I'm going to talk about circumstances that can occur uh, without you really having a lot to do with them. But as a result of them, you have difficulty serving Christ 
even though you did very well at school. So I, I want to help prepare you for, for what, is, what is in front of you. Uh, so let's get into it. Paul is born again in uh, Acts chapter 9. I want to do a little timeline here, and I'll show you why. Uh, when we think about people and the role of difficult people, Paul is converted in, in Acts 9. You know the story on the road to Damascus. As best I can figure, that was A.D. 35. So not long after the death and resurrection and ascension of the Savior, Paul is engaged in acts of terrorism and torment against believers. And the Lord uh, says uh, in his sovereign grace, that's enough. I want this man, Saul of Tarsus, uh, on, on our team. And he, changed it. He, he, he transformed him. Uh, I'll tell you, that, that is a marvelous story, and if you think God can't change it, an impossible person, you've forgotten Acts 9, because he, he is transformed. That's Acts 9, and it's easy to miss a very important statement that is said while Paul is blind, waiting for the next movement on God's part, now that he's under the sovereign eye and will of God, the Lord said to Ananias, go. Ananias didn't want to go because he knew the kind of man Saul of Tarsus had been. It, was a, it would be a, a, a frightening encounter and he couldn't, he couldn't believe the man was changed. And, and the Lord says to him, go, he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name. I'm reading from Acts 9, 16. He's to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. Next verse. Hear it well. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. What an interesting... Uh, introductory statement. I want you to go. I want you to minister to him. I want you to take his hand, help him up. He has no sight. And I want him to come to realize the things he will suffer. This is 35, 80, 35, roughly. When I turn ahead to 2 Corinthians 11, I'm moving uh, to AD 56, roughly. Okay? So we've gone ahead 21 years. 21 years later, Paul reflects on his life. And you've read the account and you've sighed, as I have, as he lists the things that happened. Verse 24, five times I received from the Jews, 39 lashes. Easy to jump onto the next thing in the list. I've never received one lash. Nor have you. Most likely. Maybe if you're from another country where that is done and where torture is still allowed, maybe you've gone through some of that. We have a man in our church who's a POW, former POW, and uh, after seven years in the Hanover Hilton, he, for the grace of God, was, was uh, allowed to leave. And his story, we honored him one Veterans Day Sunday, and when I shook his hand, uh, it was like holding onto a bag of bones. Every finger had been broken during his POW years. Uh, he could understand words like this. Listen to these words 21 years after, after his conversion. 39 times, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times shipwrecked, a night and a day I've spent in the deep. A night, 
and a day in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers and robbers and countrymen and Gentiles and in the city and in the wilderness and on the sea and among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardships through many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food. I'm glad you're quiet right now. He had uh, been starving. He was in cold and exposure. One of the books I read this summer was a story of a man who got out of a plane crash in the Arctic and spent 100 days where every one of those days were spent below zero. Story is phenomenal. Apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure of me, on me, of concern for all the churches. Woven into the fabric of that painful section are people. People. He was hounded from the very beginning of his conversion to his beheading in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, chapter 4. And I turn there, and if I figure correctly, that's about A.D. 67. 35, 56, 67. Over 30 years. This great man of God suffered uh, at the hands of a brutal evil people. I must show him how much he must suffer. Paul reflects on it in 2 Corinthians 11. He writes about our times in 2 Timothy 3. In the last days, that's now, difficult times, I often read it, have come, and the list is all about people. Listen to those to whom you will minister. They will be lovers of self, lovers of money. They will be boastful, arrogant, revilers. They will disobey their parents. They will be ungrateful. They will be unholy. They will be unloving. They will be irreconcilable. They will be malicious gossips. They will be without self-control. Some will be brutal. Haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness and so on. You know, you, you know the passage almost by heart. I know that. But you've not ministered to them yet. That's a whole nother ball game. When those you serve turn on you. Now, most won't. Let me, let me make it clear. This is not... Uh, uh, haranguing the, uh, that everybody we work with is a loser and everybody's against us and that all people are deliberately uh, wicked and harsh, hard to deal with. I don't know of any work that uh, will allow you to be with uh, some of the greatest people on the planet, like the ministry. To use the words of Hebrews, there are people of whom the world isn't worthy. When I think back over a circle of friends that I've gathered through the years, I'll tell you. I, I give thanks for them rather regularly. They have helped me in ways that I can hardly describe. Now, uh, I took time yesterday morning, just had my Bible open, and I began to uh, make a list of difficult people. <laughs> You'll be happy to know you were not on the list. No, this is from the Bible. So hang on. 
Abel had Cain, his brother, who murdered him. Start there. Abraham had Lot, who never got it right. Just a pain in the butt. From the start <laughs> to the end, dealing with Lot was a drain. And this godly, great-hearted Abraham did his best with Lot, who wound up choosing Sodom and loving the lifestyle. Esau had his twin brother Jacob who chiseled him out of his birthright. Joseph had all of his brothers who turned on him and abandoned him. Moses had Pharaoh who made his life miserable and Aaron who built the golden calf and all those Hebrews who complained from start to finish after the exodus. Joshua had Achan who secretly hid his sin, caused calamity, defeat. David had Saul, insanely jealous of him, tried to kill him more than once. He had Absalom, his son, who turned on him and rebelled. David wasn't that great a father, by the way. And he had Amnon, who raped uh, Absalom's sister. Uh, yes, Tamar. And uh, David never really dealt with it. He had Shimei, who cursed him and threw stones at him when he was down. By the way, in David's life, there was Abigail, who had a husband nobody wanted to be around, named Nabal, who was an absolute fool, and he owed her his life. Uh, and there's Hosea, who had a wife that he was commanded to remarry, and she couldn't stay faithful. Hosea's a godly guy with an ungodly wife. Job had his so-called counselors. Elijah had Ahab and Jezebel, Bonnie and Clyde of the Old Testament. <laughs> they hated him. They threatened him. Nehemiah had Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Remember? Esther had Haman, who conspired against the Jews and hoped to annihilate all of them. Daniel had his commissioners, who were jealous of him and suspicious. That's just the Old Testament. Jesus lived his life with enemies, born with Herod the Great on the throne. Difficult people like scribes and Pharisees. I was on that Sunday morning on Matthew 23. Boy, that'll get your attention. I mean, Jesus is strong as goat's breath. He comes on in that 23rd chapter uh, like seven times he goes Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, to the very people who had attacked him and made his life miserable. He didn't even flinch. They despised him. Yet Judas, who betrayed him, John the Baptizer, had Herod Antipas, who married that yo yo, -yo Herodias, and while he was drunk, and her daughter did a dance, and he he had John uh, beheaded. Stephen had Caiaphas, Peter and John the Sanhedrin, Saul of Tarsus, that whole list of people, including Alexander the coppersmith who did him much harm. And he told Timothy, don't have anything to do with him. Listen to me. I I'm not taking your time just to go over a list. I'm telling you, this is real. You're going to deal with people who despise you, who disrespect you, who doubt you, who work against you, who conspire, those who will be envious of your success, and those who will shove you down when you fail. They are not the majority, but you will feel at times they are because they are so vicious. Paul gets to the end of his life and he writes to Timothy, come before winter, longing, even though he had been through all of that. He longed for Timothy's presence 
He remembered Demas. Remember Demas? Interesting story. There's a lot of mystery about him. Alexander, who did him much harm, and then he names others. At the very end of his life, he's naming people, people, people. You can't minister without people. But all of this to say, listen to me. You need to be wise, not gullible. Not all who flatter you and brag on you have your good at heart. And there will, some, there will be some who see you as an easy take because you're young. And they'll take advantage. And you'll need the grace of God to stand against them. Some of them you'll have to discipline. You just won't be able to overlook. Many of them you will. You'll choose wrong elders and deacons. They'll make your life miserable. And they'll virtually ruin the church you're trying to build because they weren't qualified. And you realize too late that they have no business being in that position. Are you hearing me? Are you realizing that's the world you're stepping into? With your great training, and I don't know of a place that trains them better, this is not any kind of put down on this place. I would say it if I were standing at some other seminary today. It can't, the school can't do everything. Some of it is just stuff about life. You have to get somebody like me to show up and, and mention these things. So I want to close with 10 major lessons I've learned through the years, okay? No extra charge for, the, for these 10. In no particular order, I could, call, I could develop each one and it would take too long. I will go a little longer on some than others. Number one, be extremely cautious regarding those you endorse to fill leadership roles. Be very careful. Never choose anyone in a hurry or based only on personality or wealth or influence or several people's recommendation. Be very careful. Just being faithful in attendance and fun to be around does not mean they're qualified to serve as an elder. Look at those qualities in 1 Timothy 3. Read them over and over and over. Do your very best to be able to use that checklist as you select some. You want to have fewer that are better than many who are poor. Be careful. Number two, I've learned over these many years. It's easier to find purity than confidentiality. Most people cannot keep their mouth shut. So you want to have folks around you who are going to be in trustworthy positions who know how to keep confidences. You'll learn the hard way. Little by little, they will emerge Pay attention to that matter of confidentiality. Number three, this is an interesting one. Watch out for those who play a significant role in your being called to a particular place of ministry. Watch out for those who play a particular, a, a significant role in your being called to a place of ministry. They will often be the ones who turn on you later. I don't know why. It's an interesting syndrome. That's a story I could get into several times. When candidating, listen to many, not a few. Mm -hmm. 
visit homes, listen to the people that have been in the church a long time, those who don't need your friendship, and those who aren't pandering uh, for that. Ask hard questions. Number four, keep your distance from the opposite sex. Do not spend time alone with someone from the opposite sex. Don't go in your car alone with her or with him who is alone. Don't go to dinner with them. Don't sit on their bed at the hospital. Don't write them little notes. Keep your distance. If counseling is necessary, have someone of that sex with you when you're talking with them and leave your door ajar. Remember the four perils I've told you about before. Silver, sloth, self, and sex. They're often one of the reasons or a major reason for a downfall in ministry. Silver, sloth, self, and sex. Don't hold their hands. I had a lady in a former church that wanted to always hug me and kiss me. Brother. <laughs> Top of everything else, she had bad breath. And, and, uh, talk about desperate. Uh, I had one that had a love affair with me and would write me love notes. Boy, when the staff found out about that, they gave me fits. She left me little gifts in the pulpit. And uh, on and on. And finally, I told our security, uh, find a way to remove her. Now, I, I, that, that sounds terrible. Like, I, <laughs> like he's a hit man or something. <laughs> he could have been. But I, I said, no, just so we saw her in line. She was going to come by and fawn all over. And, and, and he said, uh, you see that door over there? It says exit. And she said, yes, I do. He said, that's the door you want to walk through right now. Because if you don't, I will arrest you. Uh, it was a threat. It was a, he wouldn't have, but uh, she thought he would. So it kind of took care of her. She wasn't around much after that. You say, well, that's kind of rude. It's not nearly as bad as uh, allowing things that are inappropriate. Don't tell me you won't fall. Don't tell me that'll never happen to you or your mate. You don't know what you're talking about. You're in the majority here. There you'll be all alone. And the enemy knows just the right setup. Stay away from a close relationship with the opposite sex. You've got your hands full dealing with those of the same sex. By the way, if you're a preacher, you probably are not a counselor. It's awfully good to have those who counsel well and let them help you with that. I have a man who stands down front with me and I point to him when someone asks for help and I will say, see that gentleman right there? He's a person I would go to if I had a need in my own family. That's the man I would talk to. And it's wonderful to have him right there. And he helps me with those situations. So far, by the grace of God, I've never been in a situation that has been questionable by the grace of God. Number five, no matter how much you need it, don't take money from anybody. Don't handle the money. Don't count the money. Don't transfer monies, don't accept money, and do not borrow money. It is filthy lucre. 
If you're up against it, that's why you have elders. And your integrity will help you when you say to them, I am really strapped and let me explain why and I need help. Maybe the church can help, maybe not. But don't do any of it secretly behind the scenes. It'll bite you. Uh, I have people want to give me money and I immediately hand it to an usher, ask him to put it wherever they count it. I don't know where they count our money. I don't know where our safe is. And just recently I found out about the process we go through and I've been, I started the church over 18 years ago and I just found out the process. It's a very careful process. And our staff, our, our, our pastors never touch the money. We only get the reports. Uh, I, uh, I hope you hear me here. It just doesn't look good when folks see you taking money. Even if a person says, make sure this gets to Houston and helps them in their need. If it's an exit offering, tell them to put it in the plate in the exit offering. You don't handle money. It's a good time for me to add one other side of this I didn't write down, but I'm going to say it. Oh, be careful about taking money for things you do for folks. Years and years ago, I decided I should never take a dime for doing a funeral. It's just a personal conviction. And I've turned back $1,000 checks. I've given back two $100 bills that came in the mail. I have uh, spoken with people who begged me to use it for something. I'll say, no, if you want to do that, do it through the church. But I don't take money. I love the one that you lost. I didn't do it for a fee. And you ought to give thought to that regarding weddings as well. Uh, but some of that's up to you. Number six. Some people are not just difficult. I said earlier, they're dangerous. I've been threatened several times in my ministry. When I was in California, I got a note that came. Still makes me kind of tremble to think about it. From an individual, he said he was going to rape my wife and my two older teenage daughters. Uh, I showed it to uh, LAPD. They checked it and they said it's authentic. You have an alarm system? I don't. Get one. You have security here? Well, not much. Beef it up. This is real. More recently, very recently, until yesterday when they arrested him, we were threatened at Insight for Living by a man who listened to our broadcast. He said, you told me if I gave money to the ministry, all my problems would go away. <laughs> I gave money and my problems did not go away. I would never say that. That was a lie, but he's deranged. And he said, as a result, I'm going to kill you and your wife and everyone in that blankety blank building called Insight for Living. That was in August. He resurfaced in September. And just yesterday was arrested for a felony where they got him. And he's behind bars and we will press charges. Uh, he's deranged. Hopefully, he gets the help that he needs. This is real, folks. You are the target of those who will do you harm. I'll, I'll stop there. If Paul had an Alexander and John and Diotrephes, don't be surprised. Here's another one. When you are targeted by the enemy. Some do not have your good at heart. They want to bring you down. They want to bring down your ministry. On a little different note, number eight. When hiring or releasing someone from your ministry, do not manipulate the process. 
Here's what I mean. Talk no one into joining the team. Talk no one out of leaving. I've done both. I've regretted it every time. Every time. I've just been convinced so-and-so should join up. I've been equally convinced so-and-so should not leave. And I've applied pressure and my style of salesmanship, and I talked them into it. Do I regret that? If someone needs to leave, release them. Quit dragging your feet. Quit feeling sorry. If they need to leave the ministry, they're hurting the ministry. It's not good for them, and it isn't good for the ministry you're a part of. Release them. Be fair with them. Even generous, if, it, if that's appropriate. By that I mean uh, with your severance. But holding on to them, thinking it'll work when it hasn't worked for X number of years. You're dreaming. Uh, and by the way, when you stay out of it, the Lord has a wonderful way of leading them. And you're, you look back and you go, boy, that was great how God did that. Two more, and you're very patient to sit through this list. Number nine, when you're led to leave a place of ministry, do not expect everyone to understand and affirm your decision. <laughs> Those transition times can include some major surprises and real disappointments. People don't quite know what to do when you leave. And funny things happen. I just call it funny things. Though it isn't funny. It's strange. And you'll see a side of them you never saw before. Some who were very close to you will distance themselves from you. Those who once affirmed you over the years will blame you for something you're not responsible for. You just are following the Lord's leading and leaving. By the way, don't spend forever leaving. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get out. I don't mean you announce and they leave that night, but a month is plenty of time. Three months is far too long. I gave a church three months one time, and it was three of the longest months. It felt like quacking at the end of that third month. I was such a lame duck during that time. So move on. Move on. Number 10. If you're married, your relationship with your partner, your spouse, is the single most important relationship in your life, aside from Jesus. So we'll leave Jesus out of the picture for a moment. You know what I'm saying when I say that. No other person should know all the things you share with her or with him. Your spouse's opinion regarding big decisions is more important than anyone else's opinion. Listen to them. They are rarely wrong. <laughs> Aggravating sometimes how <laughs> right they are. I've said to Cynthia, it's amazing how your voice and the voice of the Holy Spirit kind of sound alike at times. <laughs> You have no higher priority than the cultivation of your marital relationship. Your last breath, no one should grieve more greatly than your partner. In the calling that you've sensed to a place of ministry, if your spouse has no peace, don't go. The old story was, you go and they'll find a way to like it. I've dealt with a lot of those who never found a way to like it. 
and they made their lives and their husband or wife's life and family's life miserable. As I look back over the years of ministry, my greatest delights and my greatest heartaches have been related to people. Remember, I added both. And I'm not here to turn you against anyone. I'm here to help hone the edge of your discernment because I want you to succeed. I, I want you to get into and enjoy as best you can a life of ministry in a depraved world so that you can look back over the years and say God was really good to give me such close dear friends and to help me through such difficult times. 